Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. Happy New Year to you all. Today, we'll dive straight into our home labs, how to plan your lab, buy or build your own servers, some cool projects to get you started, and take a look at Inbox Zero. All that and more on the Pseudo Show. Welcome to the Pseudo Show, your home for all things enterprise open source. I'm Eric, the IT guy, and joining me every episode is my hardworking co-host, Brandon Johnson. Feels like it's been forever with that holiday break. How you been doing, buddy? Doing pretty good. Uh, you know, it's been a nice, relaxing break, and I actually got a bunch of new hardware over the holidays that, no surprise, why not throw in a tablet there for, for fun? Wait, you? Tablet? No. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I didn't get any more tablets. Uh, I, I'm trying to wean myself off that addiction. But I did get a bunch of new hardware for the lab. And of course, that's what we're here to talk about, you know, taking a little break from uh, the uh, enterprise class uh, uh, software and talk about our home labs. I'm really looking forward to that. How about how was your holiday? Yeah, I hear you there. It's uh, we we uh, we spend a number of episodes deep in the weeds of of enterprises, and you know it's it's just seemed fitting. You know, first show of the new year, just kind of sit back and and get back to the roots of the show and 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 chat about something that we're both pretty passionate about. But I think the I think the headline is we made it out of twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a tough year. A lot of great things came out of it. Pseudo Show came out of 2020. You know, here we are, episode 16. It's I'm really excited. And I don't think it's saying too much to say that the best is yet to come. We've got a lot of plans for this year for, for the show and for guests and new content. So I'm, I'm excited. So before we dive in, we... We got a lot of audience feedback over the break, and a lot of it was around the announcements uh, surrounding the CentOS project. So first of all, we should probably re reiterate at this point that Brandon and I may work for Red Hat, but we are not spokesmen for Red Hat. So that being said, we were able to make a couple of connections. So if you go check out episode 204 of the Destination Linux podcast, the flagship for, for DLN, uh, there's a great interview with Mike McGrath. They get in deep on DecentOS Stream and what uh, what the news around that announcement was. Uh, we, we may touch on, on it eventually, but uh, but for right now, I'd feel it probably best to to leave it up to Mr. McGrath to to share that information for you. Kicking off uh, this episode with our first sponsorship this year is our friends at Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and businesses to store, share, and sync sensitive data. You can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to check out their amazing service. I love Bitwarden. I've moved my whole household to it. We've really been taking full advantage of our family plan. What's great is you can start out for free, get your feet wet, and when you realize what an easy-to-use tool it is, just jump in with the annual plan for just $10 a year. Need more users? Upgrade to the family plan at just $40 a year. That's cheaper than most individual plans out there, but gives you a total of six users with all the awesome features that come with it. Go and secure your family's account with a free trial at bitwarden.com slash DLN, and thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring this pseudo show and the entire Destination Linux network. All right. We've been teasing this for a while now, Brandon. I'm sure our audience is excited to hear what we've been building. Although I have to say, I'm glad we waited till after the holiday break. I know we both got some lab time in during the holidays. So tell us about your, your new lab. Really, I just got some hardware to augment what I had. So I started off building a home lab a few years ago. Originally, I got into enterprise class hardware, blade systems from HP, big, noisy servers. Uh, I'm just going to say this, don't do it unless you absolutely need it. I replaced this hardware a few years ago with a couple of super, actually th three super micro boards, Intel Xeon D1500 chips, uh, Xeon chips, four cores each, eight threads each, threw in 32 gigs of memory in each box. And I did a hyper-converged configuration of Overt, which uh, utilizes Overt for managing all of this with uh, you know, KVM as the hypervisor and Gluster for the storage. That's been running very smooth since about, I think I picked up that hardware in 2016. I actually just backed up everything that was running on top of Overt, and I... 
uh, have decided to implement OpenShift in place of Overt. Uh, containerizing a lot of my services I'm running here at home, also continuing to run virtual machines. OpenShift can manage virtual machines just as well as Overt, uh, but I get it with a more modern uh, quite frankly, more fun system to play with. I mean, Overt's been great. It's still one of my favorite open source projects for managing virtual machines at scale. But the future of Red Hat is OpenShift, and I need to get become very familiar with it. And uh, this is a great way for me to do that. And you know, that's one of the reasons why I build it uh, a home lab is for learning. A hardware I picked up for the expansion uh, is actually uh, workstation class hardware. So I wouldn't describe it as server class. All AMD, by the way. So make uh, Ryan happy over at DL. Yeah, I, I jumped on board the uh, all AMD train this uh, this past year as well. My my single server and my uh, Linux workstation both run all AMD, and I couldn't be happier with the with the power usage, uh, the lower temperatures, and, and the performance has been amazing. I kind of joked at the beginning of the, of the segment that uh, I, I was glad that we waited till after the holidays to to record this episode because well. <laughs> As as Brandon can attest, I had an idea in my head of how I wanted my my lab to look, and I just ended up going a completely different direction. A at work, I'm I'm kind of shifting focus. I'm not it's not really a new position, but I'm I'm kind of re recentering myself on and what my focus is going to be. Now at the office, I'm doing a lot of work of uh, uh, infrastructure focus. So Red Hat has a, a product portfolio that spans everything from operating systems to to microservices and everything in between. And I'm I'm really focusing in on the infrastructure stuff for obvious reasons, having been a, a, a Linux systems administrator for a long time. Anyway, all that to say that uh, that I, I decided with that information in mind to restructure how my lab was going to be laid out. Uh, so a few months ago, I bought a single server and just bought uh, parts on Newegg based on what was available, what was for sale, and, and, and bought it built it, and then I'm running RHEL 8 on bare metal, and then using Cockpit and Libvirt, I'm actually running a series of RHEL and Fedora VMs. The original plan was to run all of my production home networking as contain as Podman containers on the ser on the server, and then having kind of a kind of a sandbox virtualization network. But instead, <laughs> instead, I decided to go a completely different direction and decided to spin up multiple servers. Go back to kind of that whole one service per VM type architecture, mostly because I'm Ansible and and Satellite are going to be a big part of of my my lab here at home and the work I do during the day so having <laughs> having more vms lying around kind of helps out <laughs> like from a from a network perspective what are you using eric like uh i know i uh turned you on to unify you with ubiquity for for wireless uh are you using anything what are you using for switching and and all that so for right now, since we've just got the single server, uh, I went all in on uh, Ubiquity. So I've got the security gateway, I've got an eight port PoE switch, and uh, and a pair of their pro line wireless access points. And then the the controller for the Unify equipment is actually running as a Podman container on my on my server. Nice. Yeah, I'm running all Unify. I I was exploring uh replacing some of it with uh microtech but the ease of management like i i don't have a big network back networking background uh, i've been a linux guy most all my career and just being able to quickly be able to provision and uh vlans uh just point and click with in Unify and Unif the Unify solution handles what I need. I mean, it's a decent. I I would say from a switching pers perspective, a prosumer grade. I, and I wouldn't quite call it data center class, but definitely for the prosumer, I I think it's a, a really good piece of hardware. I have a, one of their ten gig switches. That, their work that's working very well for my storage backplane. But it does everything I need, and, and like you said, I'm, I'm not a networking guy. I have no desire to be a networking guy at this point in my in my career. So having the Unify web based UI is amazing. In fact, I've even got the app on my iPad. So if I'm trying to troubleshoot a network connection, I just pull up the controller. Of course, if I can't get to the controller, I know where the issue is. But, <laughs> but I mean these. 
these are great devices and they work great for for like you said a prosumer or i'd even say small business yeah a lot, a lot of people have asked me i mean like we, we could have gotten into like what the hardware is i really haven't really talked much else about what my hardware is mostly it's lenovo super micro that that's what i typically gravitate towards if you're going to get started you want to do this and best way to learn i i always say go to the cloud i mean i, I know DigitalOcean is one of our sponsors but uh go to do use the credit it's a great way to get started if you're just learning how to use Linux and le- le- learning all these great applications that are out there. I actually do a bit of a hybrid for my home lab. I have virtual machines running in DigitalOcean, mostly just so, so I have quick access back into my home network uh, if I'm just out and about. Like sometimes I, I don't have reliable internet when I'm tr- normally traveling and it just makes it easy to just SSH into a server uh, that's on the public cloud. So I don't need a ton of bandwidth for that, but then I can go get back into my home lab, if uh, my home network if I need to. What, what's your approach there, Eric? When I was just starting out a few years ago, getting involved with the community and and starting to take on Linux from more than just a, a, a day job perspective, I started out on DigitalOcean. It's it's been the staple of 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 my home infrastructure from the beginning. Um, it's it's great to be able to spin up a five dollar droplet, go break SE Linux, not be able to back out your changes, and just blow away the droplet and try again. So it's it's a great way to learn and get started. And it actually didn't start trying to move away from DigitalOcean until I was getting three or four or five more beefy virtual machines running out there on a day-to-day basis. And then when the quarantine hit, it just, it made even more sense to bring all that back in house, (laughs) quite literally. (laughs) But uh, as we talk about decreasing restrictions or starting to travel again at some point, I could definitely see going from going to more of a hybrid approach. So if I'm in a different corner of the country, it might be nice to use an Ansible playbook or something to move my next cloud instance from the home uh, to a data center that's closer to where I'm going to be for a few days. Or or like you were talking about, Brandon, um, DigitalOcean, a, a $5 DigitalOcean droplet is a perfect place for a Bastion host to be able to connect into your your in-home services without exposing your your home port directly to the to the entire public internet. Instead, you just basically open up your firewall wide enough for that single port to get to your digital ocean box. And, mm-hmm. and that's the only box on the public internet that can see your home network. Yeah. Actually, quick question on, on that. Are, are you considering like a v- open VPN? Are you talking WireGuard between home and, and digital ocean? I have uh, switched everything to WireGuard. Like I have a point-to-point VPN from my home to to DigitalOcean, and I also have another point-to-point VP, WireGuard VPN going to uh, another location where all my backups go. Is that the Batcave? Uh, if my if Batcave is my parents' house, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have a. Just a point to point, not a ton of backup, but like just uh, stuff that like if uh, if it wasn't backed up on a regular basis, uh, I'd be sad about losing mostly, you know, like my personal stuff. Uh, actually, I just kind of want to stick with the, the getting started because like what, what I've been doing for, for uh, the backup target uh, at my parents' house is actually a single board computer. A Pine 64 Rock Pro. Oh, yeah. It's just a single system uh, that's sitting there uh, just uh, receiving data from, from my house. The single board and those modular, uh, I guess, micro PCs are becoming more and more powerful every day. That could actually be a great way to get started. I mean, a Raspberry Pi is amazing and has a lot of different functions and, and, and uses, uh, and its small size makes it makes it even more powerful. But I mean, even just spending a few hundred dollars on a NUC or a Rock Pro, some kind of a single board system, mm-hmm. that can really go a long ways for not a lot of dollars so that, especially if you're a systems administrator where you kind of need a bunch of smaller systems so you can under, <laughs> so you can kind of get the feel for what it's like to manage multiple systems. Going with smaller, less powerful systems is a great way to go. I mean, that's that's why I moved... Uh, away from just a pure container-based architecture back to having multiple uh, small VMs just so I can see how does this look when I try and run a a playbook that's going to jump from system to system. Mm -hmm. What I really like about the single board computers is I can do basically anything with them. 
Um, at my storage system is all single board, um, utilizing uh, Ceph. It's not as performant as I would like, but it does the job. Like I am, I'm not running an enterprise class uh, storage array here. I just need enough for so that C file can read and write my files. But what's really cool, especially when you're running something like Ceph, is essentially each board becomes its own drive. So it makes it really easy to identify a system that's failed, replace it, and put it back in. And that makes it pretty performant since it's only a single disk in Ceph terms, that's an OSD with a single, you know, since it's just a single disk, I don't need that much more memory. I can get away with four gigs of RAM and, and these lower powered uh, systems. So, I mean, we, we kind of talked about the whole reproducing an enterprise grade uh, infrastructure in, in your basement versus, you know, these single board computers. And, and I've got some I've got some thoughts on this, but I, I kind of want to pick your brain on what from this whole getting started theme. How would you recommend somebody get started? I mean, a, a, outside of a dollar value, how would you recommend people size their lab? Well, it's really dependent. I mean, like if someone wants to like wants to learn off enterprise grade hardware, go on eBay. Go buy a couple of Dells, couple of HPs. You can get an HP Blade system, the C. Uh, I think it's the C three thousand that plugs into standard power outlets. You don't need special, um, you know, outlets. You don't need two, you know, two forty power. Mm-hmm. That works pretty well, but it will consume every watt it can get. If you if uh, if power's not an issue, this is the reason why. And noise isn't an issue. Go for the enterprise class hardware. You can get a, a pretty awesome lab for you know between two thousand to five thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I've actually gone through a company called the Server Store and another company called Server Monkey. They yeah. they specialize in literally buying pallets of off lease hardware, and they're always in great shape. Uh, I I bought a 2U Dell server a couple of years ago that way. It worked awesome. I didn't have any performance issues with it. It was just power and noise. It, those things are designed to sit inside an environmentally controlled data center, not not somebody's back office. Yeah, or basement. I really like going with prosumer, consumer-grade hardware. couple reasons. One, power and cost. I can get more... I feel like I can get newer hardware for less money. I'm not getting as much hardware, but I'm getting newer hardware uh, if I go with a prosumer, consumer-grade hardware. So what I mean by that is workstation-class hardware like uh, Lenovo, ThinkStation, or ThinkCenter uh, systems. They're not server hardware, so they don't have things like IPMI. They don't have uh, for for lights out remote management. They don't have a lot of the stuff that you would expect from a server. It just depends on what you want to get out of it. If you're looking for just like I want to run a next cloud server or a C file server, next cloud and C file run reasonably well on a Raspberry Pi. Just buy a Pi. Run and run Nextcloud on it. Uh, but if you're looking to do more, so I decided a couple of years ago what what's the buyback time? What, what's the uh, return on investment? You know, I could easily spend a thousand dollars a year just on public cloud. I decided instead spend that thousand dollars a year on new hardware on 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 lab hardware. And so I can experiment with things or just run things daily. Like Home Assistant, I run Home Assistant in a virtual machine. I run C file uh, in a virtual machine. I actually just discovered a new open source project called C Table that was created by uh, the guys that wrote C file. And I'm a huge fan of Only Office and the Only Off the whole Only Office uh, suite. So I have that running, uh, you know, running uh, those services in uh, public cloud and uh, along with uh, the associated storage that I would need to purchase in the public cloud. Yeah, it's, it's it's really the storage that kills you on the cloud. It ends up being the storage. Yeah. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. If you're just learning, you want to learn, public cloud might be the best way. But if you're going to end up running a lot of this stuff day to day, and then you have a lot of storage, uh, go with buying some hardware. The the ROI is uh, immediate by uh, keeping it in-house. 
Oh, definitely. And something to keep in mind is you can you can go to your local micro center or something and just pick up a higher end desktop chassis that can be a server. I mean, you can spend four or five hundred bucks on something that's pre built, and that's a server. Mm-hmm. It just depends on the operating yeah. system you install on, on, underneath. Then uh, there's <laughs> then there's their approach I took, where I decided I, I was going to buy multiple systems, but I I couldn't settle on on a build and then still stay within budget. So what I ended up doing was I I, I targeted uh, a 12 core AMD card and then 128 gigs of RAM, found a motherboard to match, and, and then uh, I I got a 2U server chassis bought three eight terabyte spinning disks put them in a raid a couple of uh, nvme one terabyte drives for the operating system threw it all in a, ch- in a in a chassis plugged it in called it good that that system is going to is going to carry my family's needs for for quite some time and uh, as well as my needs for work i still have six or so slots open for more hard drives so if i need to expand storage i've got that option uh, but basically, I just bought a system, maxed it out, and and my my next major leap forward, if if I decide to change up how I'm doing my infrastructure, is to just I probably won't buy an, one more server. I'll probably buy two. That'll give me a cluster of three. But I mean, it just it depends on the use case. I mean, you can spend thirty five dollars, you can spend thirty five hundred dollars, or you know, you could go nuts and and go bankrupt with this stuff. It's you know, it's kind of like the home automation track. Once you start down that path. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really hard to start. Once you start down the dark path forever, we will it dominate your destiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I had to shy away from doing the whole storage area network as well because I was going to buy a 10 gig switch. <laughs> and yeah, it just it, it gets out of hand really quick. Yeah, it does. Uh, thankfully, 10 gig switches aren't that bad. Yeah, they've definitely so. come down in price. And now, now uh, one gig you know, even 24 port one gig switches have, have turned into basically nothing. So, uh, that, that brings up a good point. And and this is something that both you and you and I face, and and that's the whole spousal approval factor. How, how do you convince your significant other that spending a thousand dollars a year or $2,000 a year is, is worth it? I've, I really haven't needed to get the approval. When I first got the, did the first one, I was like, look, I just need a place where I can do demos for my customers. And uh, that's more reliable than what I have at work. I mean, we, we have demo systems at work, don't get me wrong, but I can't, they're not as flexible. I can do a lot more stuff I'm, I'm a, in my own lab. And so the argument I gave was, it'll help me make more money. And it has. Actually, quite frankly, it has. I mean, like, uh, I, I know a lot of uh, solution architects or sales engineers at other companies and they uh, and that, that are competitors of Red Hat. And we talk about what we do all the t- uh, in our labs all the time. And they did the exact same thing. And actually, they are they can show more value by showing that they know how to use one, they know how to use it shows that they have credibility that they're running in their own home lab. And you can do some pretty creative things that you really probably couldn't show otherwise. I think it's pretty neat uh, to do it that way. And uh, that, that's, that was my argument right away. As long as I kept the power under uh, what it was with uh, my (laughs) HP adventures, she she's fine with uh with me keeping keeping the lab around. Yeah, and and that's really I mean having a home lab is is kind of a rite of passage in, in the space. Whether you're doing development work or, or operations type work, it's it's almost a, a rite of passage. And I, I I mentioned in a previous episode that I don't think I'd end up where I where I did if I didn't spend that time tinkering around in a lab, setting up systems that I'm actually going to use. I I like to tell the story about how my my first Linux server was to run Minecraft at home so that my my family and my friends could jump on the same server and and we could just you know jump on our on our laptops and play Minecraft and not have to worry about someone else coming in and destroying the the world that we're building and and from there it's like oh this is really mm-hmm. cool well what else can I build uh, well then that's when I found Nextcloud and and then Plex and then Home Assistant is just kind of spiraled out of control from there so for me it's it's kind of a two two pronged approach is you know this thing can can manage running our our network 
So we've got kind of that control aspect. I, I can run our home automation through this. We're, we're talking about getting open source based uh, security cameras. It's like instead of paying for this cloud service that the latency on, on video is just terrible. It's like I can host all this myself. And with local storage, we're not paying some cloud security vendor to to host our, our content. So we keep it as long as we've got space. And, and then, like you said, hey, I, I need this for work. And the better I do my job, the more money we make, the more money we make, the more comfortable we are. Uh, it seems like you and I are kind of on the same page as far as that goes. But maybe maybe that approach might might help someone in our audience trying to buy that, trying to justify that $3,000 price tag. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, either way, it's tough. I mean, like it's still money that you could put towards other things like do, like bit, like improving, you know, home improvement projects and stuff like that. I think the other thing that that definitely helped was when I implemented C file. My wife's uh, data was not just on her computer, but uh, a workstation that I uh, put up upstairs. She logs in, all her data's there. She's like, I don't have to get a thumb drive out <laughs> or something like that to move data around. It, th- those are the little, you know, just those little things and just doing it better. Now, that's the other thing. It has to be better. Uh, non-technical, my non-technical spouse, if a C file goes down, guess what? I'm the first person that gets called. And if it's not better than Dropbox, if your system, if your solution is not better than Dropbox, she's just going to go, my, my wife would literally just go to Dropbox stuff and flip out the credit card. That's a really, really good point. And that's, that's actually kind of a gatekeeper that you and I have to- together when we're when we're talking about projects and, and labs that we're building it comes down to do you want is is this a is this a service you want to provide for your family or is this something you'd rather not be a sys admin for mm-hmm. we, we we go back and forth on on where is that line when we're talking about certain certain tools it becomes a question of what is the overhead if if this break and i can't get to it because i'm in the middle of back to back to back customer calls all afternoon and c files down what is the risk associated with being the sysadmin in my own home but one of the things that i've been coming across lately is all of these services are just constantly at each other's throats and they're changing prices they're changing plans and they're breaking integrations. Like I used to be able to get access to my Nextcloud files in the Files app on my iPad, and for some reason that that isn't the case anymore. So the question becomes: How much is too much? Do I host it or do I buy a service? I don't use I don't self host Bitwarden. I, I use Bitwarden service. Why? Because it does the job, and it doesn't cost a ton of money for me to just use their service. There isn't a lot of ROI for me to manage the password management, just because it's only $10 a year. If it was more, I would definitely think about it. What's the, and then the the other one is email. I used to manage my own email. I will never manage email ever, ever again. I have selected my email provider. I use uh, Xmission, uh, which is a local ISP. They use Zimbra. They actually are working with Zimbra on uh, Zimbra Cloud. And uh, I've been using uh, Zimbra Cloud for quite some time now. Fantastic. I've managed Zimbra before, but it's uh, the ROI isn't there. It for me, even though it is cheaper for me, it is actually cheaper though for me to run my own email. But will I ever run my own email again? No, it's not because of the ROI. It's the, uh, uh, the return on investments there. But the time uh, that would be spent mm-hmm. managing it is to me is not worth it. I know there are better there, but sometimes I can set it and forget it. But then one day there something happens, I forget to change something and all that, and I'm blacklisted, uh, and I have to go fight that. And then I I would rather not deal with that. Mail is out of the question. I'll never manage email ever again. We've talked about sizing your lab. We've talked about getting the spousal approval. We've gone out. We've bought hardware. We've got an operating system running. What, what projects are you currently toying with, or what, what's on your what's on your radar? Home Assistant's running as a VM. Actually, I take it back. It's no longer running as a VM. It's now containerized. So, uh, but that's running on a Pi for a couple reasons. One, I kind of wanted Home Assistant to be an appliance, and the way Home Assistant is shipped is an appliance. So, I just wanted it to be in that self-contained appliance. It gets backed up all the time. It's kind of acting as a shim above all the devices. 
then Home Assistant talks to HomeKit. Home Assistant's the one that's talking to anything else since I'm using uh, iOS um, devices. Uh, and that makes it easier. I know I can u- probably use the Home Assistant app, but I, I actually really like the uh, HomeKit experience. And then I started playing around with a new open source project I found. It's kind of an open core uh, project called C Table. Uh, C Table was created by the uh, the guys that created uh, C File. It's um, kind of think of Smart Sheets. If you're familiar with Smart Sheets, uh, kind of uh, pull data in from multiple sources and kind of put it into a spreadsheet type thing and you can kind of a nice interface over over data and then i host uh an instance of only office only office for quite some time i think only i i really like the only office editors i use only office on the on the desktop their desktop editors and i implemented only office docs which is their online collaboration uh editor uh, i've had that inter- i have that integrated in a c file and I'm also playing with uh, only office groups. So only office groups is a full document management system. And that's uh, the back end of that is C file. It also has some project management capabilities. Uh, I've been using to track my tasks, some calendar capabilities. I don't really use the calendar capabilities because I'm using Zimbra. Nice uh, online email system. Uh, I actually like the email interface in OnlyOffice better than Zim- Zimbra, so I, I use uh, that to um, uh, pull down my email. And the calendar does have a CalDAV connection to to Zimbra, but I'm not using the built-in uh, calendaring capabilities. So OnlyOffice Groups has been pretty cool. And then I have a Plex server um, for managing my video and I've had a lifetime subscription for feels like forever for Plex. I have toyed with, uh, MB and then jelly thin, but Plex just is stuck. I, I really like Plex. Yeah, I've been trying to consolidate down from containers running on my desktop, containers running on virtual machines on, on digital ocean. And there's a, a company called cloud Damo. Uh, that uh, I've been using to host my next cloud instance. So I've, uh, <laughs> it hasn't been as much fun, but it's it's been nice pulling all these different services from all these different places, and, and pulling them under under one system and one infrastructure. One thing I want to do is set up a web based version of VS Code, uh, so I could have the same environment anywhere. I've I've wanted to set up Pi Hole to help with ads. WireGuard and Home Assistant are are pretty close to top of the list for uh, for for adding to the lab. Uh, and then uh, and then CrowdSec is is on my radar as well. After uh, after we talked <laughs> to Felipe a few weeks ago. Yeah, I have CrowdSec running on a C file that seems to be working. I, I've been very happy with that. The the trick with any of this though is really just to get started, and and that's why DigitalOcean is such a powerful tool. I mean, it allows you to get in there, try things out, scale from there before you even start worrying about where you're going to put a, a lab, where you're going to where you're going to get the power from, and, and and that's why I'm really excited that they're that they've been sponsoring the Pseudo Show. Yeah, DigitalOcean, uh, they've been a fantastic sponsor and great way to get going with your own home labs and. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. You can get started on DigitalOcean for free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. I just cannot say enough good things about DigitalOcean. They have been my VPS of choice for the past four years. When I started using DigitalOcean, they had firewalls and droplets. That was about it. Now you can build an entire application using nothing but their products. That's right. V, yeah, with VPCs, you can let your internal services just talk to each other, uh, spin up a droplet to give you access inside your VPC. So you can like that's how I actually handle my uh, DigitalOcean environment. Is I have everything now running in a VPC. You can now configure, manage Postgres databases. Oh, I love that having a Do manage your databases for you. That that is awesome. And you can now store your application artifacts inside a DO's uh, spaces object storage. Then when you're ready, spin up your containers inside of their managed Kubernetes service. You can do all that with their beautiful UI or control your entire enterprise through their well-documented API. The best part is their pricing is unmatched. One might say just a drop in the ocean. 
And is, is that too much? No one says that, Eric. <laughs> Horrible puns aside, head on over to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 credit. And thank you so much to DigitalOcean for being a sponsor of the Destination Linux Network and for helping make this show possible. So for today's Productivity Corner, I wanted to talk a little about email. Eric, this is an area you excel. How many accounts do you have and what's your average inbox count? For the first time ever, I'm really happy with the way my, my email is set up. I have just three email accounts, one for work, one for home, and one for the pseudo show. And my average inbox count is zero. What? what what, is that unread or is that uh what's in the inbox that's that's total okay so currently (laughs) i have uh that just came in all right i have 804 unread (laughs) and that's just in one and then total messages to 3295 and that's with uh my archive policy, doing an auto cleanup on messages older than four months and moving those into the archive folder. So then this productivity corner is mostly for Brandon. (laughs) I've picked up a few tricks over the years. First, I have different email aliases set up for different accounts. For instance, newsletters that I want to get, that I want to receive, get their own email alias. My website has its own email alias. And from there, I depend heavily on just a few things. Every email gets sorted. If it's something I can respond to immediately, I do it then. Then the email gets moved to a folder, say like a project folder. If it's an advertisement, I unsubscribe. (laughs) Unsubsquirrel. (laughs) Unsubsquirrel. Sorry, internal Red Hat joke. Google it. It's funny. (laughs) If it's an advertisement, I just unsubscribe. If it's junk, mark it as such. When I get emailed invoices, something that doesn't need my attention, but I need to keep around for documentation, I actually set up an email rule that automatically archives that email. This gets through about 80% of all the email that comes in each day. The other 20% get divided up in two ways. If it requires more discussion than a text-based medium can handle, I copy the email into the body of a calendar invite and schedule a time with the sender. That email then gets archived. Secondly, if it's an email that requires an action or deeper research, I send the email to my Todoist. This allows me to schedule and prioritize the email just like every other task I do. Once it's in my task manager, I archive the email. So Eric, how long have you been doing this? (laughs) <laughs> I have been following this method for at least eight years now. My email inbox used to look just like yours, actually just like most people's. However, the constant ding of notifications and the clutter made it impossible to keep track of anything. So when I decided that it was time for a change, I spent a little bit of time each day tackling, say, 25 emails and anything new that came up, sorting them appropriately. It took about a month to get down to just a handful and eventually to my current rate of zero emails. I know that that's the uh, inbox zero technique. I mean, d- you don't get zero emails. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that would be better. Yeah, but I actually been doing something similar, but the way I kind of do it is a little different. I think that's why my inbox is so big, but I use, uh, <laughs> but I use labels in my inbox and I archive it and some stuff I just don't care. Like inbox is kind of is a catch all for me, but like stuff I care about, it gets filed or it gets a label and I can search on the label, but it does get uh, become unruly for search. So I might, I think I'm going to have to explore this doing something like inbox zero. I don't know if it would work for my workflow, but it's something I definitely need to look into because I would love to see zero on inbox. I would love it, but I know that's going to be really difficult in with uh, my uh, workflow. You know, funny enough, I didn't discover inbox zero until a few years ago, and I actually used it to improve on my own system. Because Inbox Zero shows that email is just a never-ending stream of information. The trick is to only go to that stream a couple of times a day and prioritize. So I I made two changes with Inbox Zero. I actually disabled all audible notifications for my email. So when emails come in, I, I I don't get dinged. Because, I mean, truth be told, I probably get 100 to 200 emails a day. But because I'm sorting them, I, I just I go back to that stream three to four times a day. And I'm actually really starting to think maybe I'll just do that twice a day. You're right. It's a never it's a never ending battle. 
it just it instead of responding to every notification that comes in it probably makes more sense to just check it two three times a day for 30 minutes and just go through go through the cruft and just respond to it all at that t- in that time well and something that this, this kind of funny is that the same the same method has actually branched out into other areas of content consumption that I do. Like I've probably got 60 or so RSS feeds that I follow and I'm a big fan of I know reader. So I, I do the same thing. I'll skim through anything that's come in. I'll, I'll check it a couple of times a day. And if it's an article that I'm interested in, I'll put a star on it so I know to read it later. So that the actual inflow of, of articles that I'm reading, I, I can keep that down to basically nothing. But then I average about five to 10 articles that, that are just sitting in my backlog waiting to be read. So that, you know, if I'm sitting around waiting on a meeting to start or I just have a few minutes to burn, I've got articles just standing by waiting for me to read them. So I'm curious to see if there's any other area of content consumption that, that this uh, methodology could be applied to, not just in, uh, not just your email inbox. Thank you so much for joining us today. We love hearing from each and every one of you. You can reach us by email, contact at pseudo.show. If you'd like more of Brandon and I, you can find it over at pseudo.show and on social media at pseudoshowpodcast. You can catch more awesome content over at our mothership, destinationlinux.network. If you haven't had a chance yet, check out the network's newest show, GameSphere, hosted by Quith Whale. Hosted by Quith Whale. You're leaving that in. (laughs) <laughs> if you haven't had a chance to yet check out the network's newest show gamesphere hosted by chris ware as he looks at video games gaming on linux and the future of the gaming industry brandon anywhere else you'd like to send folks as always you can follow me on twitter at d brandon johnson or my website open-tech.net and you can follow me at it guy eric or on it guy eric.com remember the pseudo show is your place for all things enterprise open source until next time 